Um, I'm Becky Gerritsen. I'm the executive director of Eagle Forum of Alabama. We are a Judeo-Christian nonprofit organization, and we advocate, support, and cultivate the nuclear family. So we educate citizens on issues that are happening, but we also help them to engage in activism to make changes in their community. Now, as you know, there has been a serious lack of dialogue on the subject of COVID in the nation. For the first time in history, we've thrown out logic and debate, and there's basically one message that is being pushed by the mainstream. And if you go against it, you are labeled as a hater or you are canceled. The widespread alarming lack of dialogue is one of the reasons that we are here tonight. Um, this forum was created to share successful doctors um, they've been treating COVID patients and having great success, early treatment, keeping out, out of the hospital. And they, we want them to share with you what things they are doing. But it's also to help you understand why an alternative opinion is not accepted. There's a reason behind that, and we want you to understand that better. We helped hold a similar event like this in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago. It was to 700 people, it was sold out, and it was just amazing. We hope to carry this on to Dothan, Mobile, and Birmingham. Uh, Huntsville, Dothan, Mobile. Three more places that we're hoping to do this to. So let me explain how we got to know these doctors. Over a year ago, in the middle of the pandemic, our president, Eagle, our Eagle Forum president, Uni Smith, saw a real need to bring these doctors together who were saving lives, who were going beyond what the CDC said. The CDC says, go home, just wait at home until you can't breathe and then come to the hospital. They weren't giving them any drugs, they weren't helping them. She is in one of the high risk areas and she found a doctor. She wasn't sick yet, but she found one of these doctors. He said, I'm gonna give you some um, hydroxychloroquine just in case you get sick. It was mailed to her. That day, she started getting symptoms, so she started taking it. She got tested the next day she had COVID. She was down for like a day because she was taking what she should have been taking and she was treated early on. So she found more and more of these doctors and she got them together on a weekly phone call. And this doctors have now, they have their, it's their own group. They're called concernddoctors.org. They have a website. They still meet together every week. They're sharing ideas. They're sharing what they're doing. They're sharing what they're seeing with these horrible vaccine injuries that they're seeing. And so this is how we got involved with these guys. And these guys are here in Montgomery doing great work. So tonight, you're going to hear factual scientific information from these two doctors who have treated hundreds of COVID patients, and they've been able to keep them out of the hospital. Um, they'll be discussing the medical side of COVID as well as helping you understand why the alternative opinion is shunned. We're also going to have Chairman of Liberty Council, Matt Staver, with us via Zoom. He's standing by, his camera is already there and he's waiting. He has recently filed a lawsuit on the behalf of the military against the government's vaccine mandates. How many of you here tonight have a job affiliated with the military? Okay, thank you so much for coming and thank you for your service. Okay, here we're going to get started. First up, Dr. Tankersley. He is a fourth generation physician serving the Montgomery area. After graduating from Auburn with a major in history, he enlisted in the Army before going to medical school at UAB. He completed two years of OBGYN training before he and his wife spent a year training as Christian missionaries. After this brief hiatus, he returned to Montgomery and completed residency in family medicine in 2002. Since then, he's enjoyed providing care locally, with the exception of three deployments in the U.S. Army's Medical Corps during the War on Terror. He received awards for each of those deployments. In his second tour to Iraq, he wrote a paper on the water strategy for the new country. Another one of his assignments, which lasted for five years, was the medical advisor to the Major General Commander of the 167th Theater Sustainment Command, where he engaged in the role of strategic level logistical planning and possible crisis on the planet or on the continent. He believes that this has served him well the past 21 months in seeing the pandemic from a unique perspective. He has served nine years on the board of Montgomery. In 2010, he was the president. As a result of this position during this turbulent year in medicine, he be became acquainted with the dramatic changes that were legislated on our country's medical system, as well as the country at large. 
In 2012, Governor Robert Bentley appointed him to serve five years on the Alabama Ethics Commission, and in October of last year, he was appointed by Kay Ivey to be a member of the COVID vaccine working group. When he's not practicing medicine, he enjoys reading, spending time with his, the love of his life, Rebecca, and his three children and friends. Please welcome Dr. Stuart Tankersley. Thank y'all again for being here. I have uh, been honored this past uh, couple of months getting to know Dr. Peter McCullough and in watching hundreds of hours of his videos, I've uh, learned a valuable lesson. He is a committed follower of Jesus and he is unashamed in his accomplishments. And when I look back at my video of my performance up in Birmingham, I really didn't understand how intimidated it was and it felt like it was weird had I been telling about my experiences because it sounded kind of in my own head like I was bragging. But I want you to, in praying about that, I want you all to remove that concept from the devil trying to get in on this. Because what I'm about to tell you is not about Stuart at all. It's about the sadness of what we're enduring because of several reasons that we're going to get into. So my experience with COVID started at the end of February of last year when I'm one of five colonels in the National Guard that's a physician. We were put on a working group for uh, the governor to come up with contingency plans. And so that required me to jump in and learn about this COVID. At the time, I uh, had no idea what this would look like, like any of us. But in my bio, I told her to tell you what I did for five years in the, uh, for a uh, staff officer to two-star general, and that's important to understanding my perspective. If you're a staff officer to two-star general, he makes big decisions, and this particular unit is a massive um, accomplishment that we get to have. It's a wonderful thing that Alabama National Guard has. And he's a two-star commander the advisor to a four-star commander at NORTHCOM, North American Continent Commander. And in watching this team of experts do what they do for logistics in planning and actioning the plans for major logistic challenge, logistical challenges, I had no idea what I was getting into, and I learned it was like drinking from a fire hydrant because I learned so much about what it really means in a crisis for leadership to understand their limitations. And as my role, in my role as his medical advisor, it was a major role for this type of uh, unit. Every time I, it's expected of a commander, uh, of a staff officer, when he presents a problem to his commander, not just say, here's a problem, deal with it. It's here's a problem and here's how I think I can help contribute to the solution. Well, long comes March of last year, and I started understanding how the structure of our state's uh, health officer is, uh, and it's uh, unfortunate. And the reason why that is, uh, it's unique in Alabama. Our state health officer does not work for, he's not uh, an appointment by the governor or the legislature. He is uh, appointed by the medical hospital. <laughs> That was a uh, Freudian slip. He doesn't work for the hospital association. He works for the medical physician, for the physician's uh, organization for the state. And so there are 18 members on this, and so they get to hire and fire the medical, uh, the state health officer. The state health officer um, is employed by them. They are not his advisors. They're not an advisory board for him. And this is where leadership is important. To a lot of us, this just makes sense. If you are the people that hire and fire a guy, you're his boss. I don't think most of them still view their role in that manner. Uh, thank goodness we have uh, at least one that has repented from his perspective and not understanding the responsibility they have in what the state health officer does. So I'm kind of coming at this uh, from, the get, from the start of this uh, from high up to help you understand how things are organized. 
So leadership requires people to have a, um, a conviction, but that conviction needs to understand, they need to have foundations for that conviction. And if you have somebody in a position like Dr. Harris, for example, who I've known since I was a kid, he and my cousin in Talladega were the same age, and I'd go up and play with him. My aunt, who was a principal up there, said he was the first boy to ever make a 36 on the ACT that she knew of. So he's a very bright guy and a super likable guy. But here's a doctor who's never had training in crisis leadership or management. And unfortunately, uh, I think our state has suffered because of it. So um, that, that's an important part of, of understanding where we're getting into in tonight's discussion. Another important part is, how could our country allow this to occur? Where did the freedoms go? By the way, this is one of my favorite topics. I've had this discussion with thousands of people over the last 25 years. The definition of freedom has been dismissed, ignored, and manipulated to not mean what it really means. The definition of freedom is the ability to put responsible constraints on yourself. The ability to put responsible constraints on yourself. So if uh, responsible is the word, is the morally operative word, and as Christians, we know who defines what responsible means and where we can find answers to that. But our world doesn't take that perspective, obviously, and um, it's uh, very unfortunate. Now, you all all know the first, um, in the Constitution, the First Amendment guarantees us five rights, and all five of those rights have been squelched in unimaginable ways before 2020. The right to religion, where houses of worship can't open, but the bar, the casino, and other things can. People go to church even outdoors get arrested for doing it. This is America 2021. The right to, the right to free speech. We have a whole new dynamic in this world, these platforms, can, or you can be deplatformed. Uh, it's amazing that we don't accept free speech unless you agree with me. And uh, it seems to be accepted. Uh, third was uh, free, uh, freedom of the press. Well, I don't know if y'all know about this, but December 10th of last year, there was an international um, meeting and celebration by over 20 uh, organizations uh, AP, AP Europe, BBC, it's called the Trusted News Initiative. Microsoft, um, Facebook, uh, all these international big media conglomerates got together and they vowed, and this was about two weeks before the vaccines came out, they vowed they would protect the vaccines and they have done a very good job of doing it if you look at it from their perspective, I think. So the right to, to press, the press has uh, abandoned their uh, moral obligation, I think, to our country and world. Uh, the right to assemble. Well, you can burn a building down, and that's not violent, but you can't peaceably assemble at a church or other places if you don't agree with the uh, status quo. And the right to address grievances, and so that's what Doc, uh, Matt Staver of Liberty Council is going to be discussing tonight belatedly, and it's uh, the closing of the court certainly uh, hurt that, which were unnecessary. We believe the evidence shows. So if uh, we've abandoned these foundations, why? Why have we done it? And I think that the first video here that we're about to show, uh, it's just a minute, uh, kind of explains it because people don't recognize that the over the last four years, the number one preventable cause of death in our country, it overtook obesity four years ago, is loneliness. And that is a true indictment of the church because loneliness is simply a life without love, whether it is real or perceived. And our country's number one, the number one preventable cause of death, whether it's suicide, overdose, elderly people, when their family abandons them and, or they never raised them to love them or whatever, they just say, to heck with them, I'm not going to take my medicine, I'm not going to go take the doctor. But this is a true, tragic situation we're in because our soul is so dark. And in getting to know Dr. McCullough over the last couple of months, I'm so amazed that he has 
uh, in our first call for an hour, several times he kept saying, this is a darkness I've never considered. And uh, it is so true of a statement, it is sad. But uh, I'd like y'all to watch the first bi video if I... Putnam found that more Americans were bowling in the late 1990s than mm. at any point in U.S. history, and yet bowling league membership roles were right. at the lowest level in history. And this might just be some weird phenomenon of bowling. And so he dug in and he found, though, in, in sector after sector, industry after industry, community after community in life, Americans were much less associational, much less neighborly than they had been in the past. Something was happening Robert, that's accelerating uh, Putnam, now. he calls that social capital, and that, yeah. that these the, 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 the ties of trust between people are starting to fray. That. And, and as a result, people are more isolated, and this gets to the epidemic of loneliness that you talk about here. But if we and, don't and know how result, to relate to each other, how can we speak to past the, the narrative that's being imposed on us? It's a great book, Vim, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal is the title of the book. I don't think so. There's, there's lots of good tribes, right. and when you don't have those good tribes, when you don't have these thick communities, when you... When you are bereft of the hometown gym on a Friday night feeling, right. you're going to put something in that that in that hollow right. inside yourself. And, and and increasingly, where people are unrooted, where people are mobile, people are moving around, and where people are not paying attention to the local communities, they're only paying attention to the cable TV show on on one of the cable networks and and don't know their neighbors. They're going to grab onto the first thing that that takes their attention and use that as their tribe, yep. which is deeply suboptimal and really harmful to America. Politics today is so dangerous and so harmful because it's a substitute for the hometown gym on a Friday night feeling. Is that the, the essence of what you're saying? Yes and amen. I, I think that's exactly what's happening. So it's, it's um, a little nerve wracking to try to unpack happiness literature in front of one of the world's experts on happiness literature. but. The four things that drive whether or not people are happy are, do you have a nuclear family? Do you have a few deep friendships? Do you have meaningful work? Do you have a sense of shared vocation that you're doing projects that benefit your neighbor and you get to do them with other people? And do you have a theological or philosophical framework to make sense of death and suffering? Or do you have a local work? All right, and so the reason that I brought that up, of course, is it gets to the heart of who we are as a culture. Our churches don't hold people accountable in a loving environment and things like that, which I think is the solution to our problem. Uh, if that happens, I think the Lord would deliver us. But um, very quickly. But... Uh, I, when I presented a month after I got on this board, I presented to the, um, on the working group, I had the opportunity to present to a very high executive in the state, and uh, I explained we do not need to shut down the state. With loneliness being what it is, and that was news to them, uh, with loneliness being what it is, uh, you're about to really see a big, big problem you didn't reckon for. And so the biggest example of that is, I think the evidence from last year is horrific. In one year, the number of suicides increased 38%. And one of my be best, dearest friends, 20-year-old uh, son did that, unfortunately, last year, last November. Uh, very personal, but the, and then over 50% of an increase in suicides in young women. So we've got to address what's going on in our homes to think that anything's going to, the Lord's waiting on us to repent, and then we'll get to that, uh, get to the solutions that will go past these politicians, bureaucrats, and tyrants who are really hurting a lot of people, killing a lot of people, and um, destroying freedom. So um, I'm going to talk now about uh, some of the uh, treatments our group of doctors in the state uh, have treated probably, I think, 8,000 now. And uh, unfortunately, we've had maybe half a dozen who have died. Because for the first time in our life, the doctors have been told, there's nothing you can do. Like uh, Becky was saying, there's nothing you can do. Now we have the monoclonal antibodies. Antibodies, anybody gets sick early on, you need to get the uh, infusion of that. But other than that, go home and hope you get, ba hope you get better. But if not, come on back. Doctors abandoned the concept of caring about their patients in ways it's unimaginable, but I think the evidence is very clear. Dr. Pierce uh, Corey, K-O-R-Y, and a group of a dozen doctors uh, around the world, experts in uh, lung infections and lung uh, ICUs and uh, lung infection and uh, pulmonary, uh, have got together and they started understanding hydroxychloroquine works 
And the reason they found out that it worked, uh, ivermectin works, the reason they found out what works, one of the men on the, uh, one of the uh, doctors noticed in Miami, he's in Miami, that a nursing home, this is getting involved in your community, right? This is how real war works. Uh, a doctor told him, a friend told him about this nursing home that he was working at. The third floor didn't get any COVID and the first two floors were decimated. Well, guess what happened the week before? They had scabies on the, first, on the third floor and then they, didn't, they gave them all ivermectin and none of them got it. That's, this is the way we operate on a daily basis. But unfortunately, all of this horrible uh, uh, shutdown that have led to so many deaths, they believe that 85% of people that would not, uh, that have died from this in the world would not have, if we treated them with evidence-based things over the counter or, or, or the prescription medicines. 85%. When I uh, had the opportunity two weeks ago to speak with Senator Tuberville, and I asked him at the outset, how would you rate our country, how would you grade our country's response to this pandemic? And he said, uh, I'd give it a four out of 10. I said, I was thinking of a letter, and I said, well, okay, I agree, it's an F. If you look at Johns Hopkins data, Johns Hopkins every week updates their data. Uh, the United States of America, the greatest country on earth, remains in the bottom 20 out of 185 countries in the world in mortality rate. Yet we accept this as okay. The only people to blame are the ones that don't, didn't get an unproven uh, shot. This is insanity. I hated that the governor was uh, deceived in her statement about that a month or so ago, that, w I, that we're, the, we're to blame? Where's the science? Because the science would not support her statement. This is not an attack on her. I'm just saying, if, our, if, the, if Alabama's governor takes that perspective, and then of course we know what's going on in Washington, wh where is the evidence? Why don't people get to present? And I'm saddened to see we've invited all of the board members for the Medical Association tonight, along with Scott Harris, and none of them showed. Is, is Mark here? Is Mark here? Okay. None of them showed. Um, this is the resistance we get. Dialogue is not acceptable. So this is an example of an outpatient treatment. Um, uh, wonderful protocol I've used countless times uh, with great success. People, let, let's go ahead and start from the beginning on treatment. If you get COVID, I don't care how bad you feel, take it seriously. If you feel like going to bed, okay, go to bed, but you're going to do some things first. Take these over-the-counter treatments. Take the, uh, seek out the uh, evidence-based treatments that you have a right to receive. That's a very important point. You have a right to receive them. Unfortunately, the FDA has come up with some crazy rules recently. Here are some suggestive uh, uh, preventive, me preventive measures. Every, all of my patients know that saltwater nasal rinse is, uh, very, has always been big for me. In fact, they did a study in, in Italy last spring of last year, and people in the ICU got out two days earlier than those who didn't use saline nasal rinse out of the ICU. I don't understand how that worked, but it did. Then the other ones that were in the hospital got out that didn't, weren't in the ICU. They got out three days earlier. Um, so here are so many things. I'm glad we're gonna, you're going to be able to see this. If you want to take a picture, please do. All right, so here is a very important website that's given us the data that we would normally look to to determine our treatment plans. It's called c19study.com. It's presented, it's, uh, it, it was created by the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. And they've compiled all the data that has come forth on all these different agents, whether it's ivermectin, look at that, ivermectin studies, cases, a 78% right in the middle there, cases, 78% drop. Prophylaxis down there, 86. If you take it preventatively, it'll drop your risk of getting 86%. Late treatment, 36% improvement. Statistically speaking, all of these are without doubt beneficial. 
Uh, I mean, this medicine, all of these studies combined show clear benefit. Some obviously greater than more, but still all clear benefit. Hydroxychloroquine. By the way, hydroxychloroquine was the cure. I saw this video, it was from 2005 that Fauci gave, uh, Dr. Fauci gave, from 2004 paper, because of the 2002-2003 SARS-1, he gave the, uh, the paper proved that we had the cure for it. The cure is hydroxychloroquine. He said it on a 2005 interview that I saw myself, and I haven't been able to find it in the last year. Fluvoxamine, this is an interesting one that Ryan's going to talk about. This is one of the two drugs, this and ivermectin. Uh, Dr. K uh, Steve Kirsch is this billionaire guy, and he said, I will give a million dollars if anybody can prove that fluvoxamine is not beneficial. Not dangerous, not beneficial. And I can give, um, uh, give another million to anybody that can prove ivermectin is not beneficial. Nobody's taking his million dollars yet. Melatonin, uh, another example. Melatonin has a wonderful uh, antiviral properties. Quercetin, beneficial. Vitamin D, clearly beneficial, even though Dr. Sag doesn't think so up at UAB. Uh, vitamin C. Now, here's one Dr. Sag loves, and it was a developer for. Uh, it's an HIV drug, antiviral, that uh, the people in the... Um, that people have forced, it's on the CDC protocol, that when you go into the hospital, you're gonna get this. And there was a published paper that was uh, from September the 15th, the last month, and it proved, it, as Dr. Merrick, a famous, wonderful physician said, it should have been the nail in the coffin for remdesivir. This is an example of Dr. Pierre Corey. Of, they wrote this wonderful review. And then a month later, and I've got the evidence of it up here, it was retracted because it hadn't been proven to be beneficial clinically. And in this, it shows the 14 ways we know scientifically how it helps against this virus. This is one of Dr. Pierre Corey's uh, algorithms, uh, I mean, Dr. Peter McCullough's algorithm. Uh, another, a lot of overlap between these experts. Dr. Uh, Zelenko is another one. But I'd like him to play this to sum up my, situa the, my presentation because, um, Eric, if you could, because uh, this is Dr. Peter McCullough giving a speech la uh, two weeks ago, I think. I can tell you, on this slide. And this sums it up, I think, pretty well. But there are effective treatments. Get the treatments early. Uh, the point about vaccines that he is making is the lies. They have to be lies now. There's no misconstrued data. They are lies because the data on the vaccines in overwhelming fashion in every category now is unfortunate that we've, uh, that we've created this trap for ourselves. I don't know if you've heard two days ago, for example, that Sweden said no more vaccines for, of Moderna vaccines for people under 30. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to know more, there's the Great Barrington Declaration, there's the uh, Rome Declaration, and then there is the uh, Nuremberg, oh yeah, then there's the San Juan Declaration. But overarching all of these, and Dr. McCullough speaks about this in another, article, another speech, he says, I think that the legal system will eventually, if we are a just country, will catch up with these people. Because the Nuremberg Code, which was created in, uh, in after World War II, says everything in a study, and this is phase three study that, you're still, that we're still in, everybody must have informed consent. And I know for a fact, not even Dr. Harris was given informed consent when he took it. So, thank y'all. All right, thank you so much. Now there will be more time at Q&A to get into hold your questions because I'm sure you have some. Next up we have Ryan McCorder. How many of you saw him speak in Wetumpka? 
I need, all right, coming back for more. That's great. Um, it's all new. This is all new stuff, so this is great. Um, Dr. Ryan McCorder, he graduated with honors from Auburn University in Montgomery. He has received his medical education at the University of Alabama School of Medicine in Birmingham, graduated in 1994. In medical school, he was awarded the G. Gale, am I saying that right? G. Gale Stevens Award for Excellence in Communication and the Mutual Assurance Award for Excellence in Family Medicine. He is certified to practice family medicine and by the American Board of Family Medicine and is licensed to practice medicine in the state of Alabama. He is a member in good standing with the American Board of Family Medicine, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the Institute of Functional Medicine, Cellular Medicine Association, Bail and Donine Method, Practice, Klingheart Academy, Medical Association of the State of Alabama, and many more. But we're running out of time and I want him to have enough time to to speak. He, he attends a minimum of 50 hours of continuing education. He is really into trying things that are different than what the big pharma says. And he is fun to listen to. Come on up and he's going to, I don't know, we need to turn the camera off. No. It's so excited to see everybody in my hometown. Got less people here than we did in Birmingham. Don't know what that's about. And all my patients may know all this stuff. I don't know. I talk about it every day. I'm going to shock you, I think. I'm going to uh, really make you struggle with your sense of justice and where we are in our country and, and how we were raised and what I was taught. And, and uh, it's going to be quite um, a shock to you. It's going to... Um, your, right, your sense of right and wrong is really going to be um, um, uh, challenged, and then what to do about it. So like he's saying, CDC, everything's safe and effective, get the vaccine. Um, this is from my previous slides real quickly. This is uh, 65 studies, I think. Masks don't work, don't bother, um, unless you think 3% reduction if you wear it all the time. Um, you, if you want to get some COVID uh, protection, you probably need to look more like this, because that's how they look in the labs. Um, I showed that about, there was about a 40% inflation in actual COVID deaths when they actually looked at the records in hospitals. This is an absence of, um, whoop, this is an absence right here of the flu. So there, there's a hump there, that's 19, there's a hump there, that's 20, and then where's the third hump? There is no third hump. In July 21, 20, 21 of 21, um, CDC said, well, the test didn't really show the difference between the flu and, the, and COVID. I do believe in COVID. It is different. There is something different. And so I don't mean to say it was all the flu, but something happened to the flu. And it wasn't masked. Um, this is Guinevieve, uh, Genevieve Brianne from Johns Hopkins. She showed that really, in, not this year, but last year, there really was no increase in, in deaths at all. Average death rate was 78.6 before that, and then during COVID, it remained 78.6. So although it's a pandemic, nobody died, and it didn't turn the age down. This wasn't a bring out your dead pandemic. Um, this is um, research that um, uh, um, Pfizer released to the Japanese. The ovaries show a 64 times um, concentration in women's ovaries. It starts within two hours after the vaccination. Only 25% stays in the arm, unlike other vaccines. Prior to this, I was pro-vaccine. Um, my kids have been vaccinated. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Um, this shows, um, this is kind of interesting slide. The, as you go higher in vaccinations this way, the fertility rate of various countries is lower. We need to study this a lot more. It hasn't been that many you know, uh, years, but um, a, a phase four study goes into the fifth and 10th years. Pfizer study was studied for about two months. Um, this was Hervé Seligman, genius guy, a huge, super detailed guy. He says it's affecting female fertility. So the NIH is changing the story. Um, as you may know, Rand Paul's been getting after um, our beloved Dr. Fauci pretty hard and um, got him on oath saying they didn't do this. Now they are admitting that they did have something to do with um, 
um, funding what they call gain of function. Gain of function was made illegal in the U.S. and so they took it overseas and we paid for it overseas. I think Ben Swan, a great reporter, um, reports about $2.8 million sent to that lab to make this superbug. Um, these guys, um, Norwegian scientists and British scientists, say that it was man-made. There's unique fingerprints there um, that it didn't come from a natural source. I think at five, or I think, I can't remember, it's been a while. And actually the French and Japanese scientists agree as well. So, um, in, uh, Agenda 201 ended about three months before COVID. Basically it was an exercise, Johns Hopkins and uh, um, uh, shoot, I can't remember who was all involved there, but um, they basically said what would happen if we have a pandemic, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we're going to stop communication and truth-telling. And I mean, uh, uh, Freudian slip, I promise. Um, and so they would, would affect social media. Okay, it's coming in points there. So it's, it was a worldwide pandemic, it'd be a novel virus, um, took place on October 18th. COVID was three months later, so. so as Professor Klaus Schwab says, it's a pandemic, this pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. So fear has caught, like those people in the, with that, um, those water bottles. I don't make fun of those people. There are people like that. They are that scared. So freaking out over um, things, it's a very high survival rate. Most everybody, few really succumb to it, especially if you do what, what he was just talking about. Um, PCR test, the inventor, if it's over 35 times, we were cycling in the 40, 40 range here, 30 earlier. If it's 35, 100% are positive. Everybody has it. If you test everybody in this room and you cycle it 35 times, you all have COVID. So if you didn't really have COVID symptoms, you didn't really have COVID. You have to have some symptoms, although we now know 42% of people have positive antibodies and never had it. So it's confusing. Science is confusing. There's not a, um, a lot of hard, fast rules. What I mean is if you, they tested you positive, but you really didn't have symptoms, they tested you because your sister had it or whatever. We don't know if you really had it or not. We have to look at antibodies. So lots of censorship, ridicule against docs like us, although I really personally haven't had any. Um, uh, that's a 47 study, masks don't work. Uh, they moved COVID patients in with the most vulnerable that really um, hurt a lot of people. Um, messenger RNA vaccines were never used in humans prior to this. They did not have animal trials, don't believe that. They did have animal trials for SARS-1. That's almost too scary to talk about. But in SARS-1, when they got vaccines to, gave them to the animals and re-exposed them, all the animals died. Their recommendations were, uh, let's not do this in humans. We have not necessarily seen that yet, but we are worried about that. Um, Dr. Malone, who developed messenger RNA, is, is pleading for the program to stop. So lots of fear out there. We're here to stop the fear, and we've been expecting stuff like this since we started reading our Bibles, right? <clears throat> Natural immunity is truly always best. And there, somebody just mentioned something new to me, something new out there. Let's see what happens when people really have good immune systems. So small businesses shut down, churches, you just can't believe that. Thank you for, um, um, who is the preacher in California? He said, no, I'm keeping my church open. I'm not here to save people from colds. I'm saving, saving people's souls. Um, MacArthur, MacArthur, yep, got his, one of his Bibles, actually. Okay, um, so natural infection versus vaccination, which gives more protection. If you, um, natural protection ranges from 6.75 to 27 times, depending on the study, than in those who are vaccinated. So, I cannot believe that isn't at least kept in, in the conversation when you're talking about mandatory vaccines. If you can prove you've had COVID, you're done. You don't have to worry about it. You really don't. Um, recovered patients don't benefit from a vaccine either. A couple different studies on that, but this certainly was, was one that said it did not. 43, this is a U.S. study, 43,000 people had COVID, really had COVID, not 
the um, phony PCR testing had COVID. 43,000 by antibodies had COVID. Only nine ever got it again. One was serious. So you, it won't say never, but almost never. 20 times better protection in that study than the vaccine. Here's Senator Rand Paul. Uh, maybe he'll pop up. There he is. Um, he's quoting Johns Hopkins professor Marty McCary. Um, lots of herd immunity out there. This was a very, very good study. This is a jump up and down study, if you're somebody like me. Um, T cells were taken out of bone marrow at the University of Washington. I see one of my fellow doctor buddies out there. He, he, I remember when he was walking around as a young doctor with a, his coat like this, and he had a Washington manual in his coat. It came from there. These guys went after bone marrow and pulled out um, T cells and they were positive for COVID. We know from SARS-1 19 years ago, those people don't get SARS-CoV-1 again. So that's lifelong or 19 year immunity is what they proved if you've had COVID. Uh, that's Macari talking about how good everybody made fun of natural immunity, but he says, here it is, I'm still kicking. Um, vaccine rates not linked to lower COVID rates. Don't ask me, I'm just a redneck, but epidemiology paper finds and that's epidemiology. They're the ones who are actually really counting. So <clears throat> I know a lot of people have been vaccinated, although this group probably not so much. Um, Y'all maybe smelled a rat. I'm going to tell you about that rat here in a minute. So what about the flu vaccine? I get this question every day. You can take it, but the Department of Defense, when they tested military recruits, they gave them the vaccine. They increased corona infections that year by 36% in those who had gotten the vaccine. Good study here out of Johns Hopkins, zero COVID deaths in children. Health, healthy kids. Yeah. Uh, out of 48,000 kids. 48, kids, zero COVID deaths. They don't die from COVID. They always have something else. There were three or 400, but they don't die from COVID. This lady, interesting, kind of corroborating that original story here. Um, there's an article that says depopulation through forced vaccination. That was written in 2011, 10 years ago. She saved the paper. Hoarder. Love it. <laughs> See, Paula? <laughs> That's why I got to save stuff. You never know. This guy, incredible resume. He's worked for the Gates. He's worked all over. He predicted and has been jumping up and down since the beginning, you can't give vaccines to people that have the disease. The disease will jump around and change, change in six hours. He's right. In Kerala, India, which boasts 93% vaccination rate, more than half of uh, all new COVID cases are fully vaccinated, as are 57% of the COVID-related deaths. That's the Journal of European uh, European Journal of Epidemiology. He has been using Israel, da Israel data and showing how the vaccination rates um, have been creating pressure, and I'm fixing to show you. This is the part where you're going to start getting mad. He says, it's becoming increasingly difficult to imagine how the consequences of the extensive and erroneous human intervention in this pandemic are not going to wipe out large parts of our human population. One could only think of very few other strategies to achieve the same level of efficiency in turning a relatively harmless virus into a bioweapon of mass destruction. He is not joking. I'm fixing to take it a whole nother level. This guy's pedigree is incredible. <clears throat> this is Stephanie Seneff. She's at MIT. She's a senior researcher. All this is like blah, blah, blah. But the big word is uh, synuclein, and it really leads to early Parkinson's. I have four patients that have rapid neurological decline since getting vaccinated against my recommendations, I might add. I've never recommended it. I won't say never because that's a big word, but I, I have not to any in case to case um, um, whatever interviews or inter whatever you call it when a doctor talks to the patient. <laughs> Okay, um, this is interesting stuff. The Spanish researchers, um, they said that there was tremendous levels of graphene in the study, in the vaccine they looked at. So everybody says, what is graphene? Number one place in the world for graphene, I was told, I can't verify this, is in Coosa County, Alabama. Did anybody know that? Oh, very good. Not like, it's similar, it's close to graphite. But is that true, number one? 
So it's a, it's a miracle molecule, really. It's a thin, it's, it's, it's one layer, like in, in geometry. It's not a point, it's a plane. It's not, has no thickness, but it can superconduct. It's fantastic, but not in a vaccine. So I, I didn't tell my patients that. I almost couldn't believe it until I found Karen Kingston, a former Pfizer employee, biotech. She's a, 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 she drills down to the details, gets the legal part right, and she said it is in there, big time. I'm like, golly, it's no good. Does anybody else say it? Well, yeah, this lady does too. She's in one of the factories in the U.S. She's making it where, by the way, I think she said less than 50% of Pfizer employees will get vaccinated. She said it actually glows under, under, under ultraviolet light. There's a mystery ingredient. I can't remember the number, but it's called luciferase. Lucifer um, uh, of light as in meaning light. Um, and it does glow under, uh, but it, we, uh, those are both known toxins, by the way, graphene and luciferase. Um, it, it speeds up a compound from lucifer to um, I'm not making this up. Um, graphene bioface optically controls heart cells. Is there, I just quick studies to show you there is research on graphene in animals. Um, this was a slide I showed in, in whatchamacallit, I, I lied about it all being new. Um, this one, it, it showed that if you um, shined a, basically a light on these cells, they glowed and otherwise they didn't. And not only did they glow, but they sped up, they got faster interesting uh, physiological display of, um, of control using an outside energy source. So it also in, uh, induces changes here. I, I could have filled it up with graphene slides, but I didn't think y'all would really want to see all those. Um, but you might want to see this, SARS-CoV-2, the spike protein, known toxin. It's also the known design of the vaccine. Get the spike protein, get 75% all around the body. In one autopsy, it's found in every organ except the liver and the optic bulb. Um, spike proteins like the artery walls and they form very weird blood clots. Blood clots so bad that a mama who gets vaccinated, her baby dies from diffuse blood clots. That's a bad molecule. Not so safe and effective. So medical, medical particles and many vaccines, but don't worry, line up and take your shots like happy little robots. This is uh, John Rappaport, he's always pretty entertaining. But that's right, that's true, that's verified. So what did Pfizer say in their study? So from day one, I got their study, and everybody's saying safe and effective. I saw it everywhere, I heard those words a million times. I'm still hearing it, safe and effective. So I read the study. It's what interested doctors wanna do. So if you'll see right here, severe reactions. In the vaccine group, 240 severe reactions. In the placebo group, 139. What's safe? Very safe. Very safe. You're a fool not to get it. This is their stuff I read. They gave this to me to read when I asked them. So another nice thing they did that really confused us is after two months, they felt sorry for the people who didn't get the vaccine and they gave it to those people because it worked so well at reducing symptoms, not keeping people out of the hospital, not saving from death. Those people, it kept them um, from getting sick less often. That's where they get their 95% reduction. And there was some hanky-panky in the testing. They said they ran out of time to test the symptomatic ones who'd had the vaccine. I mean, you can't make this up. Um, if you dig into that, you'll spend hours and you'll be sick at your stomach. Some people that had the vaccine were kicked out of the study because they had serious vaccine, um, they like broke the rules, which really could mean they were at the hospital trying to live, kicked out of the study. Um, so, could, so delete the control group, you know what happens? We can observationally follow everybody, we know who's who, but you lose the group. So if infertility is affected, heart attacks happen, who knows, you can't follow those people. So this lady, a lot smarter than me, an infectious disease expert, says the Pfizer RNA vaccine is not safe and should not be recommended given the lab's own data that they presented. presented. I said that day one, and I'm the bad guy, I'm the alternative guy. Dr. Steve Kirsch, there are four times as many heart attacks in the treatment group in the six month trial. VAERS shows heart, heart attacks happen 71 more often, 70 times more often following the, these vaccines compared to other vaccines. Everybody's had friends with heart attacks. 
My patients that go to the heart doctor tell me the hospital is really full over there. That, that's what they tell me. As the heart guys, they're very busy and they're very young. Um, this is more of um, uh, this, uh, yeah, Herve Seligman's, when he really drilled down on the Israel data, the mortality increase versus the unvaccinated, first dose, you're 11 times more likely to die, second dose, 27 times more likely to die, and then thereafter, after the seven days from the second dose, you're four, 15 times more likely to die. That's proving what they said would happen. Not safe. And that's that, in other words, that, can, that is what Pfizer said in their study. Where's the safe and effective part? So for those above 60 years old, during the first 14 days after the first dose, deaths are 14.6 times more likely. That's if you're over 60. Jessica Rose, viral immunologist, computational biologist, says even if the vaccines had 100% protection, it still means we killed two people to save one. Ouch. The blue bars, if you're over 30, the blue bars are the people who have been vaccinated, and that's cases of COVID. We just showed it's not safe, nor is it effective. So all that funny business they did in, this, in, the stu in their study and, and presented to us, kicking people out of the study and not testing everybody that had symptoms and all that. Look right here. The blue stacks are higher than the non, like me, who hasn't been vaccinated. They're trying to catch up with me. They're trying to get me. So here's Israel, big um, bumps last year. And then the most, one of the most vaccinated, they're maybe fifth most vaccinated in the world. Look at their, they have great numbers though. They really follow this stuff. That's why we use them. Look at their numbers now. They just keep going up. They're, they're in their fourth vaccine now. You haven't been vaccinated till you've been vaccinated three times now. You're not full. They, they take your vaccine card. You got to get a new card. Mm, okay. So our analysis indicate orders of magnitude increases in deaths during the five week. These other people talking during during the five week long vaccination process as compared to the unvaccinated. Five magnitude of five. So what about in the U.S.? What are we seeing? So this is a long list. This is 30 years of given vaccines, and then this is this year. You can't even, it doesn't, it just climbs to the moon. That's, that we're up to 18, nearly 18,000 deaths now. This is, this is doctors reporting this. Every doctor seems like they don't report what they see. I've had about 40, 45-ish now, I've lost count, of serious, I feel like, I feel like, I don't know, but I feel like it happened after the vaccine. Two deaths now, seizures for three months, neurological disease, heart attacks, whole body clots. I've never seen that, ever. So look at that. You know, I don't want y'all to miss this over on the side. Safe and effective, they say. This is all the deaths due to the other vaccines. So uh, England paid for information. They said, hey, can you um, uh, look at all this data and tell us what it means? Yellow card is like their um, health advice. And they said, yeah, it's easy. Don't give it to any age. Okay, <laughs> they're still giving it, by the way. <laughs> All right, um, I won't go into this completely. Dr. Hoff showed that 61% of his patients have a positive D-dimer. I saw one today. She's had a positive, that means thick, clotted blood, chronically. Um, that's red blood cells before vaccine, that's after vaccine. You can see they're all kind of destroyed and they, they, they're, they're damaged by hitting those spike proteins, which is in the vessel wall, which are supposed to be making antibodies. So if you ever see COVID. But when you do that and you make antibodies to the COVID, those antibodies are just to the spike protein. But COVID's a big thing. And variants are big and all kind of pieces and stuff but it's affecting the response to COVID. So why is it appear to be safe? Why are they telling everybody to get it? Why are they trying to make football coaches, Washington State's coach, why are they making him get it? Well, it looks safe. Feels like, hey, he has a right to say no. I feel like he knows something, right? Turned out a $3 million job, told him, fire me. Um, it's because your immune system is down-regulated now. And you can't go fight this crazy response to the COVID. So this COVID lung people get, they don't get it because they can't go mount the response. So it's not really COVID that gets you. 
in that first week. It just makes your immune system crazy and it's a very agitating virus. It's awful for some people, certain people with certain genes who aren't taking their vitamin D and their stuff. So when you're doing that, it can't do that to the lungs. So you don't need to go to the hospital. You don't need the oxygen. But as we're seeing, it starts failing and then big troubles. So just to just show you there is some science. A patient asked me after the whatchamacallit, she listened to me, I gave her a big spiel. You don't need to get it, you're young, you're not married. I mean, she was just getting married. You, I don't know what it's gonna do to your ovaries. I have no idea, why? Young people your age don't die from COVID. She wound up getting the vaccine. I even talked to her boss on the phone. I got a three-way, her mom, her boss, don't get it. She wound up getting it. I said, what convinced you? She said, nurses. I said, God dog those nurses, what? How, what did they say? She said, your side had no scholarly articles. <laughs> well, where are they? Any nurses? Where's some nurses? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Love y'all. I bet y'all hadn't said that. Because you're here. You're trying to learn. You don't know everything. Thank you. Keep quiet if you don't know. I'm not talking to y'all. I'm talking to the computer, whoever's watching it. If you don't know and you don't study, don't say things. <clears throat> so... These are scholarly articles on our immune system and what happens. So if you knock out these infection and fighting cells, they're actually called toll-like receptors. I think I've got more, no. Um, toll-like receptors. This is an important concept. The vaccine knocks out a part of your body that, that senses, the, the, um, um, senses the enemy. So just like an airplane spotter, you see a bunch of airplanes, you got to, in the military, you got to know which ones to shoot down. You can't shoot down the wrong guy. My granddad was a fighter pilot, P-51 pilot, later flew um, uh, bombers in the war. He was shot down accidentally by the first air-to-air -air heat-seeking missile. Accidentally, mistaken identity, terrible mistake out of Eglin uh, in 1953 or so. You have to know what to shoot down and what not to shoot down. Toll-like receptors are harmed by the vaccine. That could mean higher cancer rates. So this guy plays in Atlanta. He had blood clots. He told him that they told the NBA said to be quiet about it. Now why would that be? Maybe his doctor or Atlanta fans would say, hey, man, why do you have blood clots? He's too young. These two children were supposed to get COVID, I mean, uh, flu shots. They accidentally got COVID shots. This is news today. They both have heart problems now. But it's safe and effective. Two weeks of giving the vaccine to teenage, 10 to 14-year-olds, like my kids' ages, in two weeks, um, Heart problems jumped 52%. Those are deaths in two weeks. So, in fact, deaths were down 14%. So, censorship is awful. It hurts. They're going to get me, I'm sure. People will find me. Robert Malone, here's his, here's his resume. I just want to show you. But he, he's saying that the vaccinating the low... Um, Vaccinating low death rate countries will give more deaths. Here in Taiwan, there's more deaths due to the vaccine. They keep good records. We don't. More deaths due to the vaccine than COVID. Dr. Michael Yeadon, he's the vice, former vice president of Pfizer. He left on good terms. He's issuing very strong warnings. We are in the presence of evil. These are biological agents. No vaccine has liability, by the way. This was written into Congress into... Um, whenever. So the unvaccinated are looking smarter every week. In the 90s. In the 90s, yes, thank you. Unvaccinated are looking smarter every week. So y'all that have held off, very good job. Alabama, one of the lowest. I'm proud of that. That's right. There's, there's Maine up there. They're at 70%. We're at 45% or so. Who's not getting it? PhDs. But, but they're not allowed to get into a civil rights museum because they haven't been vaccinated. Something wrong with that? What do you think of that, Henry? So the federal government is now restricting our monoclonal antibodies. I like it. Our, our UAB's Dr. Sag was in here, said get it before day seven. Nurses are being fired. 
They're telling the truth about what they're seeing in the hospital. They're scared to say anything. They're seeing weird cases, 35-year-olds with aneurysms, etc. They're closing gyms. Explain that to me. FDA just had a cat fight. This was bad. Some quotes that came out of there. I'm going to focus my, ear, my remarks today on the elephant in the room that nobody likes to talk about. Vaccines kill more people than they save. In nursing homes, half the vaccines died. He was just talking about that. Doctors have no say anymore. I read this. I can't use it. They won't let me change the hospital protocol. 52% of them have antibodies. Tennessee physician, under tr he's in trouble for misinformation. I think that's what they call this. Dr. Ryan Cole, he's on the board. He was put on the board because of his refreshing, good, honest views. And two in the board are complaining against them. Not because of anything they said, they say, but because he said he gave ivermectin to people in other states. So, but doctors aren't that dumb. We're learning. Ivermectin is on the rise. It's actually pretty heavily used here. We're finding pharmacists that'll do it. Okay, last slide. Yeah, last slide. Okay, um, Oregon senators um, bringing up a serious um, against for the CDC for, for lying, basically. 10,000 doctors and 1,000 lawyers are suing the CDC and the World Health. A bill in the house for us not to fly domestically. No one. I can't go turkey hunting anymore. <laughs> All right. So the cops don't want to wear masks. So they're going to get in trouble. But who's going to arrest them? <laughs> so, So this say, lady says, this is the uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand, she says there is going to be two classes. And she was smug too. Nuremberg Code, penalty of death, if you break them, they're breaking all of them. Tyranny died in Alberta. This guy fought a small civil fine, went all the way to the Queen. He won because they could not prove their case that he was doing anything wrong. They abandon all masks, all social isolation, all vaccine mandates. They're done. But not at Alabama and Auburn. So I'm an Alabama fan. I understand coach at Auburn may not have been vaccinated or not. He's not saying he's a smart guy. That's not his role. He's a coach. He doesn't make students get vaccines. Who is, who's asking him to do that? Let him, let him do what he wants. Let them do what they want. Freedom means freedom to do what you want. To take my talk, his talk, their talk, CDC, WHO, NIH, and listen and make decisions. Your decisions as an American. And those are worth fighting for every time. This is the biggest problem in our generation. Boy, you doctors are hard to wrangle in. Wow. Okay, we'll play it at the end then. Let me play it at the end. We, we've got uh, Matt Staver is waiting on Zoom, and we want to bring him in. He is an hour different than us. So let me tell you, and thank you, by the way. Thank you both, doctors. Mr. Matt Staver has over 300 published legal opinions. He authored eight scholarly law review publications, many booklets and brochures, hundreds of articles, numerous books, including Why Israel Matters, Faith and Freedom, and the list goes on and on. He is the host and producer of Faith and Freedom. He's got a podcast radio program and Freedom's Call radio program. He also produces a Bible study podcast. You may have seen him. He's a frequent guest on many international and national networks, cable news. How many of you have seen Matt Staver on TV before? Okay, good. Some of you, this will be new for you. He has uh, filed numerous briefs and argued in many federal and state courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court. He has argued two landmark cases before the court, which were Madison and Women's Health Center and McCreary County and ACLU of Kentucky. Prior to law school, he pastored several churches. He reads Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Syriac. Didn't even know that's how you say Syriac. From Syria. Uh, he graduated first in his seminary class and wrote the longest master's thesis in the history of the school at that time. Now, Matt, hopefully you won't 
be like these doctors and go over your time. Or else we'll be here all night. But it's good stuff. You don't want to leave. Uh, using historical research methods, he defended, okay, I'm going to skip all that. He has the highest AV rating given to attorneys by Martindale Hubble. He is a licensed as an attorney in Florida and the District of Columbia and is board certified in appellate practice by the Florida Bar. Are you with us, Mr. Staver? Well, thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you. Uh, let me just give you a little background. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Let me just give you a little background about Liberty Council, and then I want to talk about the cases relative to uh, these uh, shot mandates and how they originated and what's happening. I want to give you not only what's going on in the legal area, uh, but what you can do if you know somebody's facing one of these mandates, and then really what this is doing to our country. And it is terrible what we're seeing. Uh, Liberty Council is a national religious liberty organization. Uh, we've been in existence, uh, Anita and I, my wife, she's also an attorney. We founded it in 1989. Uh, our main office is in Florida. We have offices in Virginia and Washington, DC, right behind the US Supreme Court, but we practice in all 50 states. And we have cases right now, in fact, we have two cases at the United States Supreme Court. One uh, that I'll argue out of Boston, it's not related to this subject matter, but it's a case involving censorship of Christian viewpoints uh, in the city of Boston. I'll argue that early 2022, we'll have a decision by June 2022. And we should have a decision this week on a vaccine mandate case out of Maine. And uh, that is pending right now. And it's under review by the US Supreme Court. The deadline in Maine is this coming Friday, October 29. The justices know that that deadline is there and it's involving our representation of over 2,000 healthcare workers in that state. All of these uh, so-called vaccine mandates, they began after July 1, when Biden missed his goal, getting a certain percentage of Americans uh, with these shots. And as a result of that, he then resorted to force. And that force was the third week of July. And the first entity that had a mandatory COVID shot was the Veterans Affairs for all T38 employees, which are all the healthcare workers. And that's the largest healthcare group in the United States. We pushed back, it was on about a Tuesday of that week. We really pushed back against the VA because what they were doing was violating a number of laws, including they weren't even acknowledging that people had an option to have a religious accommodation. So we pushed back the VA several days later toward the end of July, quietly posted a one page uh, form with a checkbox, fairly easy now. And you just check it off as to whether or not you have a religious objection to the shots. Uh, they did no fanfare, no press release as they did on the original so-called vaccine mandate. Then Biden's Department of Justice, the day after the VA, this is again, third week of July, came out with some convoluted decision, an opinion, not a decision, regarding the emergency use authorization law. Now that law is very clear. The emergency use authorization law is a federal law and it is used whenever you have something that is used off label, or for example, there's nothing available and then they create something to address some kind of emergency. So you declare an emergency and then you either find something's off label and you wanna use it, like for example, remdesivir, a very um, ineffective and frankly, terrible drug that Fauci has recommended, uh, or you find that there's no current treatment, which was false because you had ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and other measures that successfully at that time were treating COVID. But at any rate, they said there was no existing treatment so therefore, let's authorize the development of these brand new vaccines. Now, the emergency use authorization is done because it's experimental and it is um, in its infancy, so you don't have the data. The research time for the average to make a vaccine is 10 years. And many take many more years than just 10. Of that time, five years, is in the testing phase. 93 plus percent of all vaccines never make it to the public deployment because they fail. 
So 93 plus percent of every vaccine that starts never makes it to market uh, because they fail along the way because they test them for many, many years. They test them on all kinds of categories of people with various comorbidities in different ages, in different situations. And then if they ultimately pass that and they have all that data, they go to the FDA and it gets approved and then it's out there for the market. Now, the FDA has had a very bad track record approving things that have had long uh, standing tests. We've seen many, many drugs that have been pulled from the market because they ultimately caused injury or death and they were FDA approved. Many of those were pulled from the market because of lawsuits. Now, you can't sue these pharmaceutical companies because since 1980, they've been immune from lawsuits. So the only gatekeeper is the FDA and the FDA is dominated by special interests tied to the pharmaceutical companies. At any rate, what you have with the emergency use authorization is an emergency. And then you have these companies that are rushing to market with an incredibly short time. I understand efficiency and cutting through bureaucracy, but when you do that with a drug or a vaccine of this kind, speed is not your friend. Speed in fact is your enemy because you need to have the testing. So the reason why the emergency use authorization is there is these are experimental and they're still in the investigational stage and we don't have the data to know all of the at reactions. Now, much of what we see today reported on the CDC's VAR site was actually reported by the FDA in October, 2020. Uh, they saw this coming and it's in a slide presentation by the FDA, but you don't hear much about that. They knew the adverse effects that were going to be coming from some of these shots, even in October, 2020. At any rate, under that law, individuals have quote, the option to accept or refuse, close quote, the product. You have the absolute right to refuse the product without question. So the Department of Justice knew that that was a problem and they issued a memo and they acknowledged it on page one. Yet, yes, that's what the law says. And that's what the FDA has said, even the chairman of the FDA. And that's what all the fact sheets for Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson and Johnson, they all say, you have the option to accept or refuse the product, period. And there's no consequences to that. It's free and informed consent because it's investigational and it's experimental. Well, the DOJ acknowledged that multiple times throughout its memo, but then it said this, it's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. They said that what it really means is we have the obligation to tell you you have the option to refuse. And once we tell you you have the option to refuse, we can then force you to get the product. That's absurd. It's like saying the Miranda a warning is satisfied when the police officer says you have the right to remain silent. Now that I've told you that that is your right, we are going to force you under pressure and penalty to talk. But that's Biden's Department of Justice. That ultimately gave them cover so that some of these other states and local governments and then the federal employers uh, and uh, not federal employers, but employers in general, including federal employees, ultimately uh, got involved. And one by one, they started mandating these shots. Now, go back to March 2, 2021, and the Biden administration has a PowerPoint and it's on our website, we have a special page with all information about these shots. And you can find the actual PowerPoint from the Biden administration, March 2, 2021 at lc.org forward slash vaccine. It's loaded with information on treatment and other kinds of things, lc.org forward slash vaccine. And in that PowerPoint, they said they wanted to have a nationwide and in fact, a worldwide vaccine passport. That's mandatory COVID shots. And you have to trace them and track them to figure out who's got the COVID shots. But they also said what they're going to do is they're going to recruit the private sector to help do what they wanted to do. We pushed back on that. And Saki, the press secretary at the end of March, came back and said, oh, no, that's not our intent. We said that's a lie. We have the PowerPoint. We know what you did with the federal agencies and that you're going to recruit these private industries. And that's, in fact, what happened in July when they didn't meet their quota as of July 1, when they didn't meet their goal. 
And so Biden started off with the VA, then the DOJ a day later issued this bogus uh, memo, and then the floodgates have opened. And what the administration has done is shortly thereafter, they um, directed their Department of Defense to issue a mandate for all men and women in all branches of the military. That was August 24. Now on that date, they knew that these uh, mRNA, Moderna and Pfizer shots were causing heart inflammation, myocarditis, pericarditis within men in the military 30 years and younger. They knew that. Why? Because Biden's task force member, Dr. Matthew Oster, said in early July, he was uh, referring to a study that was just about to be published, that it was causing men in the military to have these serious life-threatening heart conditions. We knew that, and the CDC's even mentioned. Then on July 29, the um, Journal of American Medical Association Cardiology published a study by uh, military doctors on members of the military saying that there is an increase of myocarditis, pericarditis in males in the military, 30 and under from Moderna and Johnson, or from Moderna and Pfizer, the mRNA uh, vaccines. So on August the 24th, they knew it was causing injury to our men and women and to our men in the military, but also to our women. They knew it, but they gave the mandate anyway. Then on September 9, Biden gave a, a mandate or an order for all federal employers, which is about 2 million people, and uh, civilian federal contractors, which is about 3.7 million people, to get these uh, vaccines by a certain date. For people that are federal employees or people that are civilian contractors, and they make everything that the government uses. Everything, for example, outside of, you know, the government doesn't produce anything. So let's just take the military. From the shoestrings and the shoes on each uh, military service member's feet to the most advanced F-35 stealth fight jetter, jet is made by civilian contractors. Some of these are nuclear scientists. They're high, high level skilled individuals. If they do not do what they do because they develop such specialized skills that are being used not only for the military, but for cybersecurity and so many other things, intelligence, they've developed such specialized skills that there is no transferable market for them outside of what they're doing. They have developed this very high level, very specialization uh, in, in, in terms of some of these individuals like nuclear scientists and so forth. The Biden administration is threatening to wipe them out. So we have a number of lawsuits. We have a lawsuit that's a class action lawsuit. I have a hearing coming up November the 15th. Uh, we represent uh, 24 plaintiffs, but it's a class action lawsuit. These plaintiffs represent all branches of the military, including federal employers and federal civilian contractors. Uh, we're asking for a, an injunction against these COVID shots with regards to the federal employees and civilian contractors. The deadline for them is November 22. But when they say you have to be fully vaxxed by a certain date, you have to back up two weeks. And if it's a two shot version like Pfizer and Moderna, that first shot has already passed. You had to have that by October 18. The second shot would be by November 8. So the only option for them would be Johnson & Johnson if they wanted to do it. And Johnson & Johnson's clearly under emergency use authorization. So we have three counts in this. Uh, the first one is emergency use authorization. Listen, there is no, no FDA approved COVID shot available to any person in the United States or any of its territories. It just does not exist. And it will not exist for months and months and months. We don't know when it exists. In fact, BioNTech is the one that got approved under the name Comunarity. BioNTech itself, a company in Germany that's only around nine years old, still does not know when they're going to produce it. They have no timetable. Pfizer has no timetable that they've even heard of from BioNTech. No one knows when they're going to produce it, but we do know it's going to be many months. The FDA, in its August and September letters, giving approval to BioNTech's Comunarty, specifically says that there is no available shot available to anybody in the, any, po any person in the population. The National Institutes of Health also came out and said the same thing. It is clear there is no authorized FDA 
COVID shot available to anyone. That means everything that's in existence, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, are always and still are under emergency use authorization. What that means is every COVID mandate, whether it's coming from the government or a private employer, is illegal. It's a violation of federal law because you have the option to refuse. You cannot be forced. That's our count one. We also have for uh, these individuals, the First Amendment and also uh, the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. We also have uh, lawsuits, for example, uh, in, like I say, in Maine, where we're representing thousands of healthcare workers before the US Supreme Court. We have a, a lawsuit in New York where an injunction has been issued. We represent um, many, many healthcare workers in that state. We just filed a class action lawsuit yesterday in Illinois uh, against a, a, a major medical group there on behalf of medical workers as well. Let me just give you a little bit of idea of what's happening. At Liberty Council, we've been in existence since 1989. We led the country in 2020, 2021 in litigation on behalf of churches and places of worship. We went to the Supreme Court about seven times. We had major wins in those cases. It was a very intense time, weekends, nights, holidays, whatever. We worked through it. We thought that was intense. We've never seen anything as intense as this, not only in the intensity, but in the emotions. We are working with tens and tens of thousands of people in every sector, from students to every kind of employee to every kind of a person in the military. And these people, whether they're a Navy SEAL or you know, a bus driver, when they call in, they're panicked. They are afraid because they're being threatened to get a shot that they don't want that violates their sincerely held religious beliefs. And if they don't get it, everything is gone. These are people who work for 20, 30 years. They're a year away from retirement. We have a US Air Force uh, Reserve uh, individual. He retires on December the 1st. He issued his um, religious exemption in September. He thought it would be no brainer. He's now being threatened with dishonorable discharge. He has four to five more days in the US Air Force uniform as a reservist and he's done. But now he's right there at the end and they're threatening him with dishonorable discharge. These are people who put in the military, <coughs> excuse me, everything on the line. They sacrificed everything, including their families. They weren't there when their kids took the first, when, when they were born. They weren't there with the first uh, walk, the first step. They weren't there when the baby said mama. They weren't there for the birthdays. They weren't there for Christmases. They weren't there for Thanksgivings. They were there in these places in the most dangerous places in the world some of their colleagues never came home and they love america they sacrificed everything for it and now america has forgotten them not only have they forgotten them they're dishonoring them and the chaplains that we're working with and the men and women that we're working with said they've never seen the kind of abuse and threatening bullying against the men and women of the military as they've seen trying to force them to get these covid shots and the chaplains say that the rate of suicide will drastically increase because of this pressure. We're seeing this in people in the workplace. There's two nurses at a facility out west who committed suicide under this pressure because of the stigma. There are individuals who succumbed with some of the airlines to this pressure, and they're no longer with us because they died from the shots. The Denver police forced the Denver law enforcement to get the COVID shots. One of those law enforcement, one of the people that's part of the thin blue line can't walk right now. He can't carry his children and put them to bed because he is essentially paralyzed from one of the shots after receiving the first shot. This administration is killing innocent, precious people by forcing them to get the shots. This is un-American. It's abusive. We have cried many times with the horrible stories of people calling us, telling us what's happening. We have people who, we have a, a, a woman who needs a new kidney. Her brother is a match and he's volunteered to give his kidney. And she has been removed from the kidney transplant list because she doesn't want the COVID shot. And I'm telling you, that's not isolated. It's happening everywhere across the country. We are about ready to enter into a healthcare crisis. We're already short of nurses. 
And now they're forcing many nurses to literally be terminated or quit. A hospital in New York already shut down its maternity ward because nurses walked off when they said, we're not getting these shots and you're going to terminate us, we're gone. They're closing different wards. We represent uh, Freedom Flyers. It's a group that has 35,000 transportation people. And we're working with all those levels of transportation, every airline, passenger and cargo, Amtrak and many other transportation uh, vehicle uh, options. I can tell you what, they will not cross that red line. They won't cross the red line. And what'll happen is either they'll be terminated or they'll walk off the job. And you know what'll happen when we're moving into Thanksgiving and Christmas? We will have a nationwide shutdown. And you won't be able to get your groceries and your goods and your medicines. And forget about getting, you know, the next day or same day Amazon delivery. Forget about that. Talking about things that you need to survive. It will not be able to be transported. These are people in the airlines and other transportation industries that worked through COVID. They are heroes. They worked when many people were at home. They worked through COVID and now they're being treated like trash. So we are there to defend those innocent people, to defend the defenders, to defend the heroes. And we're not going to abandon them. Let me just uh, say this. If you know someone who is facing one of these uh, COVID mandates, go to lc.org, lc.org, and click on the legal help tab right there. Fill out the legal help form. Watch the video. It's got over 700,000 views now. It'll have a million probably in the next few days. Watch the video. And then we have sample uh, exemption forms. We'll be in contact with you by email and telephone conferences. We're doing that every single day with thousands of people working every day, day and night. We've trained over 80 additional attorneys that are affiliate attorneys to come along and help our core legal staff and our staff. Uh, and we're just moving day and night through the weekends and so forth. So keep our team in prayer. But that's where you need to go for help. lc.org, click on the legal help tab, and then everything else is there for you. And then for more information on these uh, COVID shots, the adverse reactions, the breakthrough cases, the personal stories, and so much more treatment, you can go to lc.org forward slash vaccine. So with that, I'll turn it back. And then um, I guess we're going into Q&A. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Our first question, Ms. Gina Boggs. Hey, Matt, you remember me. I'm the court reporter that called you not too long ago. But my, yes. son, my son has been in the Coast Guard for, it'll be 20 years uh, in seven months. They threatened him. They sent him threatening texts saying if he doesn't get the shot, he will lose his retirement. Yeah. So he, was, he had till uh, this month, October 8th, to get the shot. So... We called our doctor and our doctor said, well, the least invasive would be Moderna. So he took the Moderna, but I'm, they're gonna force him to take the booster, you know, the next shot. Uh, my question is, is it too late for him to join the class action lawsuit? Yeah, well, it's not too late, but here's what the situation is. That the injunction that we're requesting will cover everybody in that category. Uh, military, federal employers, employees and federal civilian contracts. It's gonna cover everybody. Then we'll move later on to a class certification. At that point in time, then you can join the class. But either way, you're going to be benefited by the injunction hearing that's coming up in uh, mid-November. At a certain time, we'll let you know if there's anything else to do. But not only that, winning count one, which is the EUA, will ultimately stop all the mandates across the country. But in the meantime, should he take the second shot? Uh, well, personally, I think it's a mistake to take any of these shots, a serious mistake. Uh, I would not. You know, you're playing Russian roulette. And, you know, somebody says, well, I, I've got a, a, a revolver and it's got uh, six bullets and I've places and I only put one bullet in there. Well, maybe you can pull it five times 
and somebody doesn't have an immediate reaction. We don't know what the mid or long-term reaction is, but who would play that game when your life's at stake? Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I apologize for the pressure he's under and that he had to uh, feel like this, uh, but I definitely, if it were me, there's no way I would get the second shot. My life and my future and my health is a lot more important than these threats. Mine is an attorney question. My husband is a federal civilian contractor. A lot of the religious exemptions that we're seeing has to do with aborted fetal cell being used in the testing. At Fort Rucker, we're hearing that they're pushing back from that and they don't want to approve those. Should we turn in with fetal abortion um, cells and then our bodies as the temple of God, also in the same kind of religious exemption? Yes, uh, if you have both of those as your bases, put them in the same exemption. It doesn't matter whether um, you know somebody in authority doesn't want to accept it. Uh, that's irrelevant legally. They can't question the basis of your belief they can't question and debate your belief. They can't say, well, no, it really doesn't have aborted fetal cells and you're wrong. It can only have one question. Are you sincere about your belief? That's it. And if you're sincere, then you have to go to the next question. How can we reasonably accommodate you? And on this issue, it's fairly simple. Look, we've been reasonably accommodating employees in these places for months because you've been working either remotely or you've been working in different shifts or something. So they can continue to do what they've done before. Nothing's changed except for the mandates come down. So in your case, it's very clear, uh, all of the uh, shots, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, whether they wanna admit it or not, the evidence is indisputable, that they either used in the testing phase or some level of development, the aborted fetal cell lines. And so many of the people that are submitting these religious accommodation requests are individuals who are not wanting to participate directly or indirectly with the taking of innocent human life and the killing of innocent children. And so that is very legitimate. Um, what we have in terms of our sample letters that you can look at, don't copy them because it needs to be in your own words, is both of those. Uh, the, and, if, and if that's true for you, then put in you know, the pro-life component and you can use different scripture verses. We're made in the image of God, Psalm 139. There's lots of different scripture verses. And then also like 1 Corinthians 6, your body is the temple of God. And, and we're not our own. We have to glorify God in our bodies. That's the foundation from which everything flows, that our body is the temple. That's the foundation. So we use empirical information to determine what we're going to do with our body. You know, if we're going to uh, drink this particular clear liquid that's pure water, or we're gonna drink this particular clear liquid that we know is poison, or it has some toxic uh, chemical in it. But we're not gonna do that because we, we've learned through empirical information, there's a difference between the two. So it's not a problem to learn about the vaccines, learn about the problems, because that's how we determine whether we're going to bring something into our body, consume it, or do something with our body that's either helpful or harmful. But it comes from that foundational belief that we are not our own, we're made in the image of God, and we are to glorify God in our bodies. My name's Luke. Um, I got a question for really all three of y'all. I'm in the Alabama Army National Guard. I'm a GR soldier. I'm supposed to be mobilizing in the near future. I've got to have it to go to Kuwait. If I don't take it, I lose my insurance from my daughter. I got to have it. What I'm asking is, is there any way that you guys can go talk to our state tag? I had to sit through a town hall meeting this past weekend, and it was like watching CNN. I had nobody in the, on the panel that had been, uh, who had not been vaccinated, so I had nobody really on my side. There were a few heads in the audience that was, they, they were disgusted. I need somebody to go talk to the tag. Somebody's gotta talk to them besides me, because she ain't listening to me, and neither are her panels. The tag is the state general. She's the Alabama National Guard, top of the pyramid. Uh, hey, Matt. 
Yes. Matt Staber? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Matt, uh, one of the questions I've been wondering is, who would, have, who would be rightful in suing these people for doing this? Because to the, uh, the soldier's uh, question ultimately is, if these people are breaking, even though the Nuremberg Code is not part of our uh, legal statutes, there are other laws that are being break it, broken. Who is going to file those lawsuits against those people doing this? Because uh, I think that needs to get on people's radar. Yeah, so, I think there's a twofold step here. One, which is what we're doing, file the request for these injunctions. We're streamlining the legal so that we can take it quickly to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, rather than having a lot of factual disputes, a strict uh, legal and have religious freedom because we have a majority on the court on that issue. Uh, to stop the mandates, to stop the bleeding, to mm -hmm. stop the emergency, to do triage. And then once that is stopped, go after these people that are uh, issuing and passing on these illegal orders. Look, we have information. We're not making it specifically public. But we have dialogue with JAG uh, officers, with their commanders, in which the JAG officers are telling them, this is likely an unlawful mandate because it's violating the emergency use authorization law. So, you know, you can be punished and discharged for violating a lawful order or regulation, but these are unlawful. And they come from the commander in chief to the DOD uh, and also through the, um, the Coast Guard, which would be under the Department of Homeland Security. And then it's percolating, percolating down to the other uh, levels within these military branches. And they're all unlawful. That needs to be addressed. Right. And I want to start where I, I want to go back to where I started on all this. I started out apologizing for our profession. And I don't just mean our civilian. I retired at the beginning of this month. I'm now retired. But the doctors that are in each state that are pushing this and advising her to do this or allowing, giving her cover to do this, they need to apologize. We are apologizing for them. I'm sorry you're in that situation. It's, it's unbelievable. And you might be able to send, if you wanted to go to lc.org, you can send uh, to, to the gentleman that was just asking the question, send the link to the lawsuit uh, there. It's right there on the front page. There's a red bar and it talks about the lawsuit. Send the link because it contains not only the press release and the kind of people we represent, but also the complaint in the memo of law and a very lengthy affidavit from Dr. Peter McCullough. Send them that. It may not change their mind, but it'll give them some alternative information. Um, a lot of us have children, and we think about our children's futures. Um, this is probably a broad question, and some of it's already been answered, but my question is, in your opinion, what is this administration's ultimate goal for America, what our future for America is, and what hope is there in maintaining our freedoms? I think the Bible's already told us a lot of things, but the fact is the church has not stood up for truth and, uh, and accountability and love, so why do you expect the non-believers to do it? I saw, <clears throat> excuse me, so I work at one of the state universities that's just mandated, I'm sorry, I work at one of the state universities that just mandated this last Friday, which I believe both of you probably attended, uh, in your educational career. I'm um, going through the current exemption request, religious exemption, and they have like these uh, trap questions on there like, you know, have you ever been vaccinated? Have you ever used anything that, you know, what products do you use that might have come from aborted fetuses, that sort of thing. Um, now, have you, you know, some of that is the correct answer. I mean, that's my private medical history. I don't share, I don't talk with that about anyone but my physician, but what's your advice on how to, uh, handle those questions, and then I don't even know <clears throat> if the exemptions even, do they even accept those sort of things? I mean, is it someone at the university that makes that determination, or is it a, a federal employee that's that's reviewing, hey, <clears throat> re reviewing those? Yeah, do you, uh, is it a state university or private? Uh, state, state. Okay, so I mean, you have, uh, obviously you're protected by more uh, laws because it is um, state, uh, you're, you're protected by not only state constitution, but federal constitution, but also Title VII, which is your employment. 
And that prohibits the employer from going into debating the particulars or disagreeing with the particulars of the basis of your belief. The only question is, are you sincere? Or are you just making it up? Does your, since, does your religious belief really affect your life and how you make decisions? That's the only question. Now, they're coming up with all these trick questions and they, they pop up one place and then we see it spread across the country. And one of the questions is, have you ever had any vaccine since the age of 18? Well, if you have, then you, they say, oh, well, then you can't get an exemption. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Your, your issue is COVID. And one of the issues, as the previous uh, woman was mentioning, is that they're associated with, in a direct way or indirect way, with aborted fetal cells. There's other issues as well. Um, but the other thing is they're, they're giving you questions like, have you ever had Tylenol or ibuprofen and so forth? You know, they've tried to make the idea that these things were made with aborted fetal cells. That's nonsense. Tylenol was discovered in 1955. There were no aborted fetal cells back then. It had no association with aborted fetal cells. You know, if decades and decades later, some lab someplace took an existing Tylenol and they tried to see, well, how does this work on this test? And let's use an aborted fetal cell. It has nothing to do with the product. And there's no evidence that that actually happened anyway. But they're giving all these trick questions. If you go to lc.org, click the legal help tab, fill out the form, and then send us, that way we'll be able to communicate with you. We have uh, answers to a lot of those questions and we're de developing FAQs that go through every one of those bizarre trap questions. Hey Matt, hey Stuart, what I'm putting on my, my uh, request for that is simply, it is none of your business, it is a medical decision and how dare you ask this and um, I've never gotten it back. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a legal question, and it's kind of with regards to the exemption request. So moving on from the active duty who have had to submit it, they've met their deadlines. Not that I know of any have been actually granted. Moving on to the Department of Defense employees and the contractors, the Undersecretary of Personnel and Readiness has not even published the guidance for how to submit it, who to submit it to, yet we have deadlines coming up based on the 22nd of November. What guidance would you give for submission and who would you give it to? You're exactly right. What they did was they gave you a mandate, they gave you a date, and they've given no guidance on where to submit it or the process. Uh, so you're left in the dark. That's part of our lawsuit that we're actually raising, uh, that they've given you a date. Uh, they told you what happens if you don't do it, but they've given you zero guidance. And that's across the whole country. This is the whole bait and switch. This is the whole gotcha kind of thing. Uh, this is the whole abusive kind of um, way that this administration is operating. Submit it to somebody, uh, your employer, or but the employer, if like you're a civilian contractor, the employer's not going to know <clears throat> who in the agency su to submit it to, but make sure you submit it to some person in higher authority in, in the administration of your company or some other uh, location so that you have a record of it. Uh, yes, my name is Woody Bagwell and this is for the doctors. I know way too many people that have had these shots and my question is, is there anything they can do to try to reverse or maybe like take ivermectin for the rest of their life or whatever and if it's ivermectin how do you convince them it's not horse medicine? The question is how can you what can you do with people that have been vaccinated and that is a great question and we're still learning as we go but uh, the good news is the uh, in the studies looking for the spike protein it was most heavily concentrated in the spleen second place was the ovaries so the spleen is removing it our immune systems are learning and and it does degrade over time so um, and that's why they, they have to give you boosters so often but um, which, by the way, I keep have to giving them to, to stay passported. Um, I have a protocol that I give, much like is basically the treatment. You really want to um, get zinc in the system inside the cells. It tends to mess with that um, um, configuration that's occurring with the um, graphene oxide. And then um, also um, the quercetin, which helps the zinc do its job. Uh, um, N-acetylcysteine, which may be on the chopping block. Carl, is that, on, is that gone? 
not gone. Thank you. Um, and then uh, N A C N acetyl cysteine, and then uh, vitamin D. Of course, you should have been on that for the last 20 years. Um, and then uh, um, am I forgetting any? I think I think that's it. And then. Yeah. Oh, ivermectin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ivermectin for life. Dr. Zelenko is saying that. Um, th that may be because you don't need any more challenges. Um, if you have bad challenges, maybe we'll st we will see that pathogen priming like we saw with the old animal studies where they all died. So, yes, and, and that's in a, a weekly dose. Okay, but, can we... Um, oh, I'm sorry, Stuart. I was just going to yes. say that if you uh, have to get the vaccine and you decide to go ahead with and go through with it, uh, I think Dr... Um, Peter uh, McCullough and Zelenko believe you should take hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin a couple of days before you get the vaccine, and then you will be, I think the evidence has shown up to four weeks after you get the vaccine, you'll be shedding the spike protein, so you may want to take it for the next four, um, four weeks. And uh, so, once again, the science shows that the ivermectin neutral and the hydroxychloroquine will directly neutralize some of the spike protein itself. That's not voodoo, that's science. Um, so. All right, I want to just pivot here real quick. Um, Matt, thank you so much for being with us today. It was great to have you. And we will definitely be watching the outcome of the case in the, the date in November, you said was the 15th? The 15th is the, when we do oral argument. We have, a, we have an injunction hearing in our Illinois case on Friday, um, but the one with the military, federal employers, and contractors, that's November 15th. Okay, wonderful. We have a lot of military in this area, and so keep up the great work, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. And for everyone else, um, please give these doctors a great round of applause. On, on your seat when you came in was a little piece of paper. And on one side were great suggestions. It's not medical advice, because we are not allowed to do that, but those are things you should be taking if you want to stay healthy on one side. Another, and, and then on that same side, it says things you can do and things you can take. At the bottom is FL, www.flccc. You can find specific dosages and protocols. If you've been vaccinated, you still need to do those things. Like they were saying, this is, you need to stay well. Um, on the other side are different ways that you can get active within Eagle Forum. But I just want to thank you all. Oh, I want to recognize someone. Besides uh, our state auditor, do we have any other elected officials here besides Mike Holmes, our representative? Will you please stand up? House Representative Mike Holmes from Elmore County. He is all about freedom, and thank you so much for being here. Um, Matt, I mean, Mark, would you like to close us out in a prayer? Now, these don't have to rush out, make some friends, talk with the docs, but some people did come from far away, and I told them we'd be out of here by 8.30, so here you go. I want to do a one-minute promo first for Eagle Forum. Great job, Becky. Let's thank give her a round of applause. Awesome. I really wanted to thank all of our volunteers. Please give a round of applause for all our ticket scanners and thank you guys. I've been working at, uh, around the legislature. I guess I'll be starting my fourth decade uh, in a year or two, which is not anything to brag about, trust me. But uh, <laughs> anyway, one of the, the more remarkable groups that works at the legislature's Eagle Forum, and they've been at it a long time. When I first started in the early 90s, they were around then, if I'm not mistaken. And they really cover, here, here's the great thing, and the promotion will come here in just a second. They hit so many issues that you care about, not just vaccines, but there, I mean, we deal with drugs on sex change that we'll have again, that we'll be, I work around these issues. I, I work with Eric Johnson, a fellow lawyer, uh, and we work on some of these issues, been working on abortion issues for a long time, just kind of a volunteer thing. But I really want to recommend that you take the time to join Eagle Forum. It's either 50 or $100. You have a choice between the two. Uh, but this is a great group 
and you know we're fighting an uphill battle but it's a battle that can be won not just on this the, the this room right here if you could take everyone in here and make a volunteer out of them uh, I, I can promise you and you started calling someone like Mike Holmes it has a profound effect in the legislature when people will go sit somebody the person that sits next to them in church and said something to them, they're more likely to do that than 10 lobbyists to ask them to do something. You are so effective. So I would really, really encourage you to join uh, Eagle Forum. They're so trusted in my role as the president of Faith Radio. We only let certain people come on the air. We're careful about it because we want to make sure they're saying what we believe. Uh, and Eagle Forum is one of those. We never hesitate to bring them on. They know the issues. They speak of it from a biblical point of view. And so I really want to recommend to you that before you leave, uh, you join her. If you can't do it tonight, you got to get out the door uh, that you do that because it's something they really need your help. Uh, let's bow our heads and pray. Yeah, sure. Go Sorry. On that topic, uh, I was going to finish with my slideshow that when you're talking with, when you're talking with your doctor, they want to know this information. They're not pig-headed. They're a little bit pig-headed. We're just, because we know and we've studied and we listen and we trust the CDC, the NIH and the WHO, we, because we've, we thought we should. But they just need to know. I would send them to our site, concerneddoctors.org. It's a great place. They'll learn a lot. They'll get caught up in a hurry. Once they're caught up, once the ball gets pushed over the hill, they're all going to get it. Don't be mean to them. Remember, they're slow to believe, but when they believe, they'll be strong. James, James, Jesus' half-brother, did not believe Jesus was who he was until after the resurrection. So his own brother, all about the miracles and all, he never heard that. He did, that didn't get into his thick skull. So be patient with us, doctors. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this uh, really informative evening, and, and thank you for Eagle Forum. We're, we're, we have many things to thank you for. And uh, Father, help us as we go forward from here to be strong and courageous, just to take the advice that you gave Joshua, uh, knowing that you'll reward us, that we don't have to worry about the outcome. You take care of the outcome. And so, Father, we, uh, as we go forward from here, I pray that you'll just strengthen everyone in here, Father, that's facing perhaps a dilemma over this vaccine, that you will uh, give them courage. And, Father, in particular, we lift up our United States Supreme Court and pray, Father, that when this matter comes before them, they'll rule the right way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great night.